join me, and I will complete your training. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. I'll never join you! If you only knew the power of the dark side, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. What the fuck? No. No, no. No. No, he says... He says, Luke, I am your father, okay? I've seen this movie five, six hundred times, okay? He says, Luke, I am your father, alright? And it's not magic mirror on the wall, it's mirror mirror on the wall. What the hell's going on? It's Mandela Effect. Wake the fuck up, okay? Again, remain calm and wait for further instructions from authorities. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. I can't cope with it any longer. Something very strange is happening around the world. Where almost half of the population say they remember things in the past from a different timeline. As if two timelines have bridged together to form something that half of the people say was always like it is today, and the other half saying that it was not like it is today. This effect is called the Mandela Effect, after Nelson Mandela. And was coined by the fact, that many people remembered Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s. They say they 100% remember this, but somehow, history, has changed. If you are someone that suffers from this effect, of memory from a different timeline, then this video might very well, blow your mind. So, stay tuned, as Esoteric Detective, brings you the top 5 strange examples of the Mandela Effect. Number 5. A small example of this, we can give in its clearest form, with the original movie Star Wars that came out in 1977. Look at this photo of C-3PO. Does this look like a normal photograph of C-3PO? Look long and hard at it. And this kind of blew my mind when I saw this. But. This is not what C-3PO looks like now. This is what people say he used to look like. What he looks like is this. Do you see his leg? It is silver. But in this case a good portion of the population remembers him being completely gold in color. This is what the internet says is a photograph from 1977. And there are plenty of examples that now history shows, that C-3PO, always had a silver leg. It is like the C-3PO, with the entire gold body, has been erased from from original Star Wars history. And I am talking about the original films. Not from any remakes or remastered versions. Since that is a different C-3PO. Let's take a look. Another anomaly, using the Star Wars film, to set more context for this, is the famous line, that Darth Vader says to Luke. Do you remember the line? That's right. He says, Luke, I'm your father. That is, Luke, I'm your father. But now in the movie, Darth Vader says. And I quote, No, I'm your father. Let's take a look. And let's see if the line makes sense to you. 
to me, it does not even seem to sound right. He told me enough! He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. He told me enough! He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. No. I am your father. No. I am your father. But wait, you might think, maybe it is just misremembering? But, if so, what does the actor who played Darth Vader remember? That is, James Earl Jones? Well, let's take a look. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're going to play that lie out. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're going to play that lie out. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're going to play that lie out. Now, isn't that really strange? The actor who played the part, at least read the lines, and voiced Darth Vader, remembers it different an immortal line in film history. And strangely, he remembers it as those who suffer from the Mandela effect. Well, you might say, it was just a slip of the tongue. Well no, because let's look at another clip of him saying it again. In a completely different interview, years apart. Let's take a look. Don't you think that is weird? That the actor, the main actor, who said the immortal line, would remember the words not only totally wrong, but keep misquoting them, years apart in different interviews? Let's look at the scene again. The scene, that just does not sound right that small portion of us, who remember it a different way. He told me you killed him. No, 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 no. I am your father. Does the line make sense to you? Or in your mind's eye, is it supposed to sound different? To many, the line just sounds wrong. And they cannot understand why. But there is the original movie, that is what history now says is said. Number 4. Parts of other movies are changing. At least how we remember them. That is, well-known movies. Like the famous line from Field of Dreams. That famous line that goes. And I quote if you build it, they will come. This is what most sufferers of the Mandela effect, who have seen the movie remember. But this has now turned into and I quote, if you build it, he will come. Let's take a look. Does it sound right to you? A simple Google search shows, at least what people are searching, and it is not. If you build it, he, will come. Could so many people who have made pictures with these words on them, that are fans of the movie, enough to do so, be wrong? Or misremembering it wrong? Also, that famous line from Snow White. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, 
who is the fairest of them all. Well, guess what? That never happened. The line now, as history says it is. Magic mirror, on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? This, even though, many people know it as, mirror, mirror, on the wall. Kind of strange, don't you think? Another famous example is from the movie Jaws. In which the famous line, or so those with the Mandela effect say, is. We're going to need a bigger boat. Do you remember that line? Well, it's not that line anymore. The line is now. You're. Going to need a bigger boat. And remember Silence of the Lambs. That line that was famous, that everyone quoted. That line that Hannibal says. Hello. Charisse. You know, that line that he says from the jail when he looks at her. Well, you can't find that line anymore. It does not exist in any copy of the movie. It is like it vanished. Or in this timeline, it was edited out. Good morning. Dr. Lecter, my name is Clarice Starling. May I speak with you? And then, what about that famous line from Forrest Gump? That line everyone used to quote in the 1990s. In that Forrest Gump voice. That line, that said. And I quote, Life is like a box of chocolates. That is, life is like a box of chocolates. Well, now this might sound really strange to those of you suffering from the Mandela effect. But that line is now. Life was like a box of chocolates. It does not even make any sense, on a writing level. Life was like a box of chocolates. Life was like a box of chocolates. Life was like a box of chocolates. Another thing is, not just popular fictional films, that seem to have been changed. But many people swear, that for instance, the famous footage of JFK, only had four people in the car. That is, that 1963 footage of JFK, before he was shot. But now that footage has six people in the car. That is, two extra people. Have a look at the footage, does it look out of place to you? These are just some examples from how movies are said to be changing. But there are many. I will do more of these in the future, but for now, let's move on. Number 3. Text is changing. That is, the text we look at. Do you remember that famous movie called? Interview with a Vampire? I sure do. But now it reads Interview with. The. Vampire. It does not seem to be the same movie as it was before, to a lot of people. Also, remember that TV show called? Sex in the City? That is how people remembered it called. Well, guess what? It's not called, Sex in the City. It is called, Sex, and the City. Other examples, and there are many, are the famous Berenstein Bears. A popular children's book and show from the 1980s and earlier. Well, guess what? It is now, and some people say this does not make any sense, but it is called. Not Berenstein Bears, as some people suffering from the Mandela effect think. But in fact, Berenstein Bears. What do you think? How do you remember it? Also, many spelling of famous people's names have changed. At least people who suffer the Mandela effect say. Here are just some examples. Number 2. Visuals are changing. That is, things that people remember, 
are no longer there. For instance, many people believe that Curious Giroge, the famous monkey from children's books and TV, had a tail. But guess what? He doesn't according to history and never has. But that has not stopped costume makers, who have been making costumes of him for many years, still giving him a tail. Lots of people swear that he had a tail. A long one that was curled. Do you remember this? Or are you one of the people, for who, he has never had a tail? Also, if you are a Christian and also suffer from the Mandela effect, you might well remember those famous pictures from the Bible, of a lion laying with lambs? It was based on the famous Bible quote, by Isaiah 11:6 that read, The lion will live with the lambs. Remember that? Well, that is no longer here in your history, if you remember that so. For now, it is. The wolf shall live with the lambs. And the strange thing is, to those that suffer from the Mandela effect, they swear that the passage read, the lion will lay down with the lamb. But now the lion is gone. Instead, he has been replaced by a wolf. One with strange green eyes. And look at the eyes of the lambs. They are black. Maybe there is a hidden message in this. I don't really know. But I do know that it is hard to erase the past, it would seem, because people still can find pictures of the lion and the lamb. The big question is, why would people draw them so, when it reflects no passage? For there is no passage in the Bible with a lion and lamb together. Maybe in time these pictures will be gone as well. Who knows? But to those with the Mandela effect, this feels very ominous. But let's move on. Maps are also changing. One such example is said to be many people who remember a large land mass of the western coast of Australia, the size of New Zealand. They say it was a large land mass, but no one can remember its name. But people swear it was there. They remember it. But if we look at a map, indeed the island is not there. You might think this is misremembering. But in fact, in the 1990s movie, Dazed and Confused, as if left by some ghostly remnant of the Mandela effect, we do see on the globe, a picture of the island. Right there, in the film. It is, a very large land mass. Just where people remember it. For something of a weird icing on the cake, the island's location, was right where flight MH17 went missing at least where search teams were sent to look. Something to think about. But other islands have gone missing also, and these have been thoroughly recorded. For instance, people remember an island called Sandy Island. People said they have gone there. It has been recorded on many maps from cartographers around the world, and sighted by many ships. But there is one problem. It is not there anymore. That is, it is vanished from the planet. And is also starting to vanish from history. But this is not the only case. People cite examples of many islands and places not being the same. Land masses, such as Mongolia being much larger in size than they remembered. It gives you food for thought, that if the world is really being edited, then who is doing the editing? There are also accounts of people who have shown up in our world, saying they are from countries that do not exist. Such as the man from Torrid. And his documented case and refers to an account of an identified Caucasian man who arrived at Tokyo International Airport in 1954, saying he was from a country called Torrid. No country by that name exists. The man insisted on his origin presenting a passport, driver's license and a checkbook issued to him by the state of Torrid. And he became very upset when he could not find his homeland on a map. He was taken to a nearby hotel and was placed under police guard, but mysteriously vanished the next morning. The Tokyo police launched an investigation, but came up empty-handed. He just appeared, with all the right paperwork a passport from Torrid, and then vanished. 
It seems there is something very strange going on in our world. At least, to some people who are picking up on it. There also seems to be a link between people suffering from this Mandela effect, and people who suffer from tinnitus, that is intense ringing of the ears. This was brought to light on the Mandela Effects Facebook group, once those who suffer from the Mandela Effects got together. What this means, no one knows. There are theories, but thin in the way of any evidence. Some people point to the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and that their experiments are somehow changing realities. Others point to the fact that we are in a simulated reality, by some supercomputer, and someone is hacking it. Maybe the beings that created it. Or maybe someone else. Others have brought up time travel, and that someone might in fact be playing with the past. Then there are others who say it is human consciousness that is changing things, in the same way it has been said to change things at the level of subatomic particles. That is the double slit experiment. Others say it is not happening at all. And it is just our imagination. That it has to do with how the mind remembers sensory inputs in a different way. And that these stick more than our true reality, but whatever is happening, it is clear that for a certain group of people, this is a real phenomena. Something that needs more research, whether psychological or something more ominous. We have, we have the creator of what is the world's first quantum computer, in person here from Burnham BBC. These are really big deals, they come in at about 15 or 20 million dollars a piece. Something like that and have been bought by major American research and corporations. That's right, correct. All right. So quantum computing is a very technical subject, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the specific details, of which I'm glad, you're sure you're glad. Um, but I'm gonna try to give you an idea about what the kind of thing is that we build and why people are so excited about it. But I'm gonna wrap that story in another story. How many of you have children? Let's see, hands. So it's almost everybody. So I have, I have three children. The youngest is four, the oldest is eight. And they're very different, but they share one thing in common. And the parents in the audience may, uh, I suspect, have noticed the same thing. Each of my children has fixated on a particular stuffed animal as being their special friend or toy. And in particular, my middle son, James, absolutely loves this little guy called Bear Bear, which is the picture that I'm showing up here. Bear Bear was a limited release uh, Thai beanie baby, and there aren't very many of them that were made of his particular form. And one uh, Christmas, I decided that it would be insurance policy to go and try to buy some more just in case something happened to Bear Bear. So I went on the internet and uh, did a search and I was only able to locate two others that were for sale and I bought both of them. So now he has uh, three of these little guys. But the reason that it occurred to me that this might be a good place to start is a conversation that I had with him last week. He wanted to sleep with his older brother in his bedroom, and his older brother wouldn't let him. And he was very sad and despondent, and he was like, I'm scared, I don't want to sleep by myself. And I said, well, you've got Bear Bear. And he said to me, Bear Bear isn't real. <laughs> and so I found this very intensely uh, distressing for a variety of reasons that maybe you'll understand when I go through this. And I assured him that Bear Bear was as real as anything else in the world. And he said, but he can't speak and he can't move. And so I said, well, what you really mean is he's not alive. And he said, yes, that's what I mean. So for very young children, the sense of being real and the sense of being alive are somehow connected. And I'm going to circle back to this point at the end. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computers and why people care so much about them. There are literally tens of thousands of some of the brightest people in the world today trying to build these machines and understand them. And I'm going to tell you why. 
In my last 15 years of working on this type of stuff, I found that scientists divide up into two categories of zealots about this field. The first half are people who are absolutely entranced by the physics of these things. This quote is from a respectable scientist, in fact, one of the founders of this field, that may be a little bit, may look a little strange to you who don't follow theoretical physics, but there is a very clear prediction that our most successful theory of nature makes, and that is that there are an enormous number, mind-bogglingly large number, of parallel realities, as real as this one, that have different consistent histories. So imagine a world where all of the laws of physics as we know them are obeyed, but different decisions were made along the way. Different decisions at the level of tiny microscopic particles, different decisions all the way up to what you just chose to eat for lunch, and whether you chose to come to this session or not. Quantum mechanics makes a very specific prediction that all of those are as real as the thing that you remember. And this is bizarre, because we don't see those other things. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. And quantum computers are perhaps the most exciting of all of these that we have within, or almost within our grasp right now. So people from a physics background love this. They want to understand the world. They want to understand the, the universe, how it all works. There's another type of person who tends to come from the computer science side that's like, yeah, okay, that's all great. But there's a different thing going on here, which is just as exciting, if not more, and that these machines that supposedly can do this wild stuff, let's forget about how they work, if you could build one, could solve problems that you could never, ever solve with any computer of the sort that we built. If you took every single atom of silicon in the world and made the most sophisticated conventional Intel-style processor that you could build, there are problems we know of that I could write down on a sheet of paper that you could never, ever, ever solve with that thing, that you could with this kind of machine. So that's very exciting. Humans use tools to do things. If you give humans a new kind of tool that can do things that you couldn't otherwise do, imagine the possibilities. So you may think, well, this is all fine and dandy, but is, aren't these things in the realm of theory and speculation kind of in the same regime as um, other futuristic things you may have heard of which may be allowed by the laws of physics but aren't here yet? That's not true. There are, in fact, many of these machines deployed now in openly available research centers following the model that was used to introduce supercomputers to the world. They're too big and ornery and difficult to operate to put in your home, too expensive also, but you can give them to a place which will manage them as a shared resource that will offer that service to the world. And there are two of these now. One of them is at the University of Southern California. And this analogy with flight, I think, is an interesting one. So a horse can beat, or could, beat the uh, initial flight of the, the Wright brothers' flight in speed. But a plane is not a faster horse. A plane is a different kind of machine. The plane takes advantage of another, thing, another resource that nature gives us, this third dimension, in order to do something that matters to people better that you could do with any horse. It doesn't matter how fast you make a horse, it will never fly, at least the kinds of horses that we know about. So these types of computers now are being thought of in the same way. They're not terrifically powerful yet, but they're doing something completely different than what your computer does. And that thing is like flight. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. And that's not the only one. In fact, the one I'm going to com come back to and talk to in the context of the story that I'm wrapping this in was recently installed at NASA. And Google uh, was the primary uh, interested party that pulled this whole thing together. And this one is really exciting to me. 
because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's a crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? So building machines like us might be possible. I certainly believe it is. I might be wrong. But what I do know is that the types of approaches that people are taking now to build intelligent machines benefit immensely from what this machine that we've built does best. So what this center is about is applying this beautiful new computational idea in the service of trying to make intelligent machines. Now, I can't think of anything personally any cooler than trying to use quantum computers to build intelligent machines, so this is very exciting to me. Steve Jurvetson has been a longtime uh, friend and investor in the company, and for those of you who don't know him, he's a uh, Silicon Valley investor who's probably the smartest VC that I know of, and certainly the one that's the most attuned to technological trends. He's, uh, he's on the board of SpaceX, Tesla, Synthetic Genomics, which is Craig Venter's company that's trying to build uh, artificial life, and D-Wave, and that's it. And this is his particularly poetic way of framing the difference between the machines we build and conventional computers. This is what they look like. There are two of them. These are from our lab in Burnaby in British Columbia. From the outside, they look like giant black monoliths, big metal boxes, about 10 feet on a side, 12 feet tall. And they are powered, the, the, they have a fridge inside them, a refrigerator that cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Just a wisp, a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. Hundreds of times colder than interstellar space. Amongst the coldest and most isolated and extreme conditions that humans have ever been able to engineer. These fridges, interestingly enough, which are called pulse tube dilution refrigerators, have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. So if you're sta you have the opportunity to stand next to one of these machines, it is an awe-inspiring thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive machines. At the heart of this big box is a tiny chip about the size of your thumbnail. And on this chip resides all of the wonder and magic that makes this thing go. I'm not going to describe in any mathematical detail how it all works, but let me give you an analogy. In quantum mechanics, there's this concept that an, an, a, a thing can exist in two states which are mutually exclusive at the same time, quote unquote. So I'm using those words because the English language was developed before we had concepts to describe what these things actually are doing. But I'm going to give you a, a, a roundabout way of understanding this. Imagine that there really are parallel universes out there, and now imagine you have two that are exactly identical in every respect, all the way out to the horizon as far as we can see, down to the last little atomic detail of every single thing with only one difference. And that's the value of a little thing called a qubit on this chip, which is a contraction of quantum bit. And that qubit is very much like a bit or a transistor in a conventional computer. It has two distinct physical states, which we call zero and one for bit. In a conventional computer, these are mutually exclusive. That device is either one or the other and never anything else. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus, a point in space where they overlap. And when you increase the number of these devices, you, every time you add one of these qubits, you double the number of these parallel universes that you have access to until such time when you get to a chip like this, which is about 500 of these bits, you have something like 2 to the 500th power of these guys living in that chip. So the way I think about it is that the shadows of these parallel worlds 
overlap with ours. And if we're smart enough, we can dive into them and grab their resources and pull them back into ours to make an effect in our world. Now, this may sound very odd to you and bizarre, and in fact, I am using language that a normal theoretical physicist probably wouldn't use, but this is, what I'm telling you is absolutely correct and in line with the way that these things actually work. We've been doing this for some time now, and in fact, we have our own version of Moore's Law. The doubling uh, of the number of these qubits on the chip has happened once a year for the past nine years. So for the last nine years, every year, the number of these qubit devices has doubled and it will continue to do so. As a point of reference in terms of how fast these things are, in one generation of chip, the one from the, the system that was installed at USC to the one that Google and NASA have now, the speed of the device went up by almost a half a million. This is the kind of progress that you're going to see with these types of machines going forward. And half a million sounds like an abstract number, but I put up a, a little mental comparison here to see what 5,000 really means. 5, 500,000 is a big number when it comes to speed. All right, so now I'm getting into the last part of my talk where I'm going to make some predictions, some dangerous predictions. So predictions are very dangerous for a variety of reasons. Uh, often they're wrong, which is one. Um, but I think they're important because predictions somehow are our internal desires made manifest. Predictions are about what we want to happen, maybe not what will happen. And I'm going to make three predictions, and all of them are dangerous in the sense that they're very unlikely to happen, maybe, but I think that there's a very good chance that they may. As an aside, I just wanted to say that at least in the, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, and maybe in the United States in general, there's a very deep feeling of unease about the way technology has been developing. Because we have all of these vast array of very smart people, and what they're doing is crap. They're building things that cannot last. They're building things that are not important. This is a little bit of a controversial point of view, but I believe it. But I think that the reason for this is it's low-hanging fruit. Computers haven't been around for a long time. And I think that what's going to happen is that as people get more comfortable with computers, the attention will turn from the Twitters and the Facebooks to very important things. So here's my first prediction. I'm going to predict that by five years, NASA will have found an Earth-like uh, planet with Earth-like atmosphere and water on it, and serious people will start discussing how we get there. And by the way, they're going to use one of our machines to help do this. So that's my first prediction. My second prediction is that this business of parallel universes is going to turn out to be very important. This picture that I've got under here is, is what's called a gravitational lens. When Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity, it came with a bunch of experiments that you could use to test it. And one of them was that if there was a point of light very far away in a galaxy in the middle, that galaxy should bend the light and you should see a ring. And this was eventually observed. And I think what's going to happen is somebody is going to come up with an experiment to test this reality of these things. And we're going to be able to do so. My third prediction that I'm going to end on is the most important of all. I believe that humanity is on the cusp of the most important technological, societal uh, revelation, revolution that's ever occurred. And that's when we got to the point where the machines that we build outpace us in every respect. I don't mean that they're better calculators. I don't mean that they're better at searching. I mean everything. And I think that we're very close. And my prediction is that within 15 years, we will have machines that outpace humans in everything. People want to understand what CERN is. Uh, if they would uh, just indulge me for a little bit, they'll have a clear understanding of why they're doing it what they're looking for, and what, what is the potential 
in the facts that will come out of these experiments. CERN, and amazingly, it won't come from the scientific community or anybody who has knowledge of physics. They will not, they will not tear it apart because they understand what I'm saying. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this as basic as possible. I want you all to imagine, if you wanna know what CERN is doing, I want you to imagine you come into a world and you find architecture all over the place, buildings and homes and houses, and you think they're beautiful and it's really a big discovery. You find out with the houses, you can house people, you can do many things with a house, with a structure. All of a sudden, after many years, you become curious and you say, what's holding all this together? And you begin to find, not nails that you can take out, but glue that has bonded itself to the materials. And you become interested in that glue that's holding the structure together. And so you're fascinated by this glue and you've tried everything to replicate it. You can't because it's hardened. Glue is hardened. You come to the realization the only way to find out how this glue is working is to break it down to its basic particles. And you have to have that glue in its former state, not the state after it's already hardened. Right? So you don't want it in the cured state, the state that you can see. You want it in its initial state, which is a liquid state, before it hardens. And so CERN, basically, is a device that will allow them to examine particles in their initial state, not after everything is bonded together. That's a very simple simple way to look at what CERN is doing. They're trying to find the glue that holds everything together. It's what they're doing. That's the entire, that's the purpose of CERN. As of now, what has come out of CERN is called antimatter, which was first actually produced, it was first produced in 1955. And CERN is a very old organization, but it was produced in 1955 and they found positrons, which are anti-electrons. To understand what antimatter is, I'm going to have to explain the very bare basics of what matter is. And, and believe me, it's going to get very weird here shortly because you're going to begin to see exactly what they're doing. But you have to understand what you're looking at now. The matter, the matter and antimatter are in fact opposites. Now, the matter that we have in front of us, if you take a piece of wood, nothing happens just a piece of wood. But if you set that wood on fire, you have caused a reaction. And then it, it's in a dangerous potential state, it's active. If you have a battery outside of your cell phone, it does nothing. You put the battery inside the cell phone, the electrons begin to flow. The electrons will flow from one place to another. Essentially, that's what electronics are, the control of electrons. They control the direction, the speed of electrons, which okay. create tiny pulses. They flow or don't flow, flow or don't flow. Those are called gates. Those gates form computers. And with a computer, we can do fascinating things. This is why they did, in fact, take Nikola Tesla's findings, because he discovered some things with electrons and protons that were very fascinating. Electricity within itself is a visual observation of electrons and protons in their active state, non-controlled state. Antimatter is the opposite of the matter that we can't control. Antimatter cannot be controlled. In fact, when they first produced antimatter, they had to have a facility to contain it because unlike the wood, where you have to have a reaction to cause it to burn antimatter, you have to have a containment to cause it not to burn. That's the only way they can store it with massive facilities to store it. Let me give you an example. In a nuclear bomb, it takes timing, which takes electronics, and the explosions have to be just right to cause a reaction. At a nuclear bomb, like the Hiroshima bomb, which takes pounds of nuclear material to cause it to react. And it has to, have, has to be very precise. Well, let's go the opposite. Let's say we had antimatter, correct? If we had one gram of antimatter, that would equal about 40 
42 or 40, but let's just say 45 kilotons of TNT, which is about four Hiroshima bombs. And it's, it's already inherently unstable. It's unstable. The only way to harness antimatter is to contain it. And it takes very large and expensive facilities to contain just one gram of antimatter. Some have failed, some have not. If those containment devices fail, they cause mega quakes. That's what happens when they fail. Now we're talking small, tiny drops of antimatter. I mean, just drops of raw antimatter. It, it's highly unstable. It has to be isolated from the rest of reality when it's contained in a literal sense. Now, given that this can be weaponized, which is true, well, there are other implications that the average person has not thought about. Our body is held together by that glue that they're searching for, that bonds matter together. Those who understand what's called the standard model, they have a pretty good idea of what would happen if the force table in the sta and the, if the standard model is just an explanation of how all things work. You're dealing with matter and force, and they have categorized the elements of matter, everything we can touch and feel and observe, in what's called quarks, the building blocks, building blocks, I'm sorry, of protons and nuclei, and leptons, which are essentially, well, that would be like an electron. And then we have force. A force are lumps of energy that transmit the forces that bring matter to life. But like a photon, it carries the electromagnetic force. Without a photon, we would not have we would not have uh, any, we couldn't produce motors or anything else. Without gluons, which carry a strong force, neutrons and protons would not be held together. In other words, the universe would not exist. And of course, you have your W and Z particles, which are for weak forces that govern radioactivity. So you have this standard model, and they have broken this down. But what they're looking for, what they're looking for is a higher explanation of how everything works. This is the particle they're searching for. Now, they found half of it. They already found a component of it. That was the Higgs field. Now, the Higgs field is an explanation of, of the, they found the traces of the Higgs field. They can now observe the Higgs field. The Higgs field is what is found wherever matter is not. In your room, the Higgs field is in operation. Listen, with the Higgs field, they can begin to alter reality as we know it. Now, a lot of people may, they can't capture that right away. But you have to remember our world is made up of matter. The antimatter is what we can't see, what we can't touch, what we can't feel, though we interact with it every day. A lot of people like to think of antimatter as the other dimension, which is the opposite of this dimension. It's an inconceivable place that is hostile inherently. It's not under control, it's very hostile. This dimension would be the more tamed dimension. Here's what they've done since the 1930s. Well, actually since the 1800s. There was a group that studied nothing but the phenomena of paranormal activity, not like you've seen on TV, not like you've seen in Hollywood, not like anyone knows about. But they studied the science behind paranormal activity and have then defined that this is a dimensional, called a dimensional slip, where things can obviously interact with this world all the time. And they were wondering the interactions between known matter and that type of matter. But they also found with antimatter, this antimatter can be absorbed by any realm of paranormal activity. It is, in effect, neutralized and absorbed. So there's a physical effect to the spiritual world and antimatter. And often, demonic entities and all these other paranormal things are attracted to antimatter. They're attracted to it. When they bring, when every, for every gram of antimatter that's produced and then it's bought into this world, when they produce it, it attracts things from another dimension coming here. What is CERN going to do? It will allow humanity to produce pounds of antimatter. 
what's happening. That is the unseen portion of dark matter. And of course, you have the angels which govern what that realm can and cannot do. It, it's not a, you know what, it, it's a shame, and I have to continue to say this, it's a shame that the Christian community can not believe the Bible when it's talking about things like that, because it's going to cause them to be harmed. What they can't, what they fail to adopt from the Bible, what they fail to believe is going to harm them. It's going to harm them. They may not be lost in their spirits, but they're certainly going to have lumps all over the place. It's going to harm them. And I hope people have a general understanding of the matter, which we can touch and feel and observe, and antimatter, which we cannot touch, feel, or observe. However, it's working in tandem with the matter. Because everything is balanced, the uh, subject of Lucifer in the spiritual sense, because God gives everything balance. Everything has balance. There is dark, there is light, there is good, there is bad. The, everything has balance. I mean, God could have not, why did he put the serpent in the garden in the first place? For balance. God can't give us an honest choice unless we're faced with an equal balance of obedience and disobedience, good and evil. And so Lucifer is used to be that balance of darkness with the light that we're given. And the reason why I see people are going to be harmed when they don't believe these things is because if they do not believe in the spiritual realm of our Lord, well then they're giving the spirits authority to work in their lives. CERN has yielded so many results and gave a true definition of paranormal activity. It's just, it's beyond me that a lot of people cannot get this through the truth of the word. They, they can't. Antimatter is being pulled out of nowhere, out of this other dimension, which is nowhere but everywhere. In consequence to that, they found out antimatter has a specific type of energy signature that they can in fact detect this is how they uh, is part of the process of pulling it out well as it comes to find out some of the not so good consequences of this process has to do with the human psyche Stephen Hawking he understands the implications of what could happen he understands how it can affect the psyche for a long time Stephen Hawking did not believe there was a God for a long time he didn't but you see something is changing with him. He is beginning to see that everything is so precise, it's impossible for it to be happenstance. I mean, everything down to a trance of a trance of a trance of a trance of a meter is absolutely precise. And he's beginning to change his mind. It's what's happening to him. He's changing his mind. He is now beginning to entertain the idea that what people call divine is in fact done by some sort of architect they have no concept of. Now with the general basis of what CERN is doing, the, the very, that's the basic, basic idea of what they're doing. And, and that's exactly what they're doing with particles. Here comes the other part that's not so good. This is why they have to do another set of it. Listen, it's not just one experiment they're about to perform. This thing is going to run six months continuously colliding protons near the speed of light to analyze particles, exotic particles that are, made, that are made at the beginning of the Big Bang. That's why they call it the Big Bang machine. It's the only way to observe these particles which wink in and out of existence in, I mean, a fraction of, of time. A fraction of time. And the consequence of this, of this search to gather more and more of this matter, by the way, they have a more efficient method of pulling out or, or, or gathering antimatter, which is why they need to know the properties of the, some more properties of this particle they have described. Once they have these properties, they will be able to extract as much antimatter as they desire efficiently. It, it's right now to obtain antimatter is very inefficient. It's very inefficient. In, in 
In other words, to get a pound of it would take about 10,000 years at the current rate. It ju it's just not going to work. CERN will allow them to do that probably within a week. But here's the consequence. They've observed the energy of both matter and antimatter. They found out that antimatter is intimately tied to every single life form on this planet. They found out that energy, energy signature is the same energy signature in all life on this planet. All life, none excluded. Found out when any life form is in the presence of antimatter, the energy of the life form changes. The energy changes. I'll put this in basic terms. A person has both dark and light already in them. It's part of their makeup. It, it's what you can't live in a material world without antimatter. Nothing would exist. And so a person has both good good energy, which would be this realm, this, this realm of matter. But they also have energy of antimatter. So they're connected. A person is connected to both realms at the same time on the energy level. And they don't even know it. They don't know it. And they have found, with, certainly, with all the experiments they found, they have found out why paranormal activity exists. They know exactly what it is. They don't want to tell anybody. This is why they perpetuate foolishness on television. But every single person, every single life form is connected to that realm, that, that other realm, and to this realm of reality all the time. Now, a person's thoughts, how a person feels, and doctors know about this too, how a person feels will determine which energy they draw from. You can draw from this realm, good realm, and you have positive results. That's called faith. That's why doctors believe in it. That's why they give out placebos. They know that if a person believes something is helping them, they have it within themselves to repair. They can command their bodies to be repaired simply based on belief. And people think they work. And people have recovered from cancer. People have recovered from uh, back injuries. Uh, quadriplegics have been repaired simply by their own faith. This other realm, because that energy is contained in another dimension, so to speak. That's the containment wall. But when a person draws that energy in, it is, it is the opposite of this realm. In this realm, again, we have to light, uh, we have to light a piece of wood with a flame to catch it on fire. In that realm, it's already on fire. You have to contain it to see the wood because it's engulfed in flames. It's the opposite of this realm. When a person changes their emotional state, their energy changes. And they begin to draw their energy from this other dimension, this chaotic and violent and uncontainable place where they draw dark matter from, intimately linked. And it's in operation all the time. Now the scientists, they are aware of this. Now here's the other part that's not so comforting. On the spring equinox, the forces change on the earth. And they know this, they know that forces do change, which will in fact allow them to have better results. And uh, believe me, it's timed perfectly. It is timed perfectly. With the basic introduction of what CERN is doing and what it is, and the, the dark matter and matter itself. Now we get into the heart of the matter, uh, of what's actually, what the, there will be consequences. It's just that uh, there have been consequences before. Nobody took notice. And the energy of the energy signature of dark matter, which, by the way, resides everywhere. But once you bring it into this realm where we can actually see it and observe it, it attracts things from the other realm. Dark matter is tied to dark matter. Everything has a connection. Everything has a connection. That connection can never be broken by anything. If they bring dark matter into this realm, it's still connected to that realm where the dark matter came from. No matter how far away they 
put it anywhere, it's still connected. Because that realm is everywhere, and it's still connected. Because it's connected, it effectively increases paranormal activity around where it's contained. And this is why they shift facilities of where they keep, they want to keep dark matter in, in a uh, college. I won't name it for the sake of the college, but uh, the, the, or the university, they had to move it to a deep underground facility because of what was happening to the people in the college. People began to have vivid dreams, nightmares, uh, the violence began to erupt and vile things began to happen in those places. And it's because it's a chaotic piece of matter. It is just chaotic. And it's very difficult to, to contain something that is so powerfully chaotic. This is what an explosion is, by the way. When an atom bomb explodes, it releases chaos. Chaos in the form of chemicals, reactions, and everything is out of order. That is the, an explosion is the absence of order. That's what an explosion is. When you contain something, you're giving it order. So it's controlled. Here's the worst part. Understanding that dark matter is always connected to its source, which is that realm where the dark matter came from, the realm that's all around us. Just imagine that dark matter being the ocean, right? Imagine this realm being the submarine. We're all in the submarine having fun. And we're, we're doing our thing and we have disagreements here, and disagreements there. And then um, we find out there's a hole in the sub. But the hole is not, we thought the hole was in the sub, but it wasn't in the submarine itself. It was in fact in the people. The people's water inside their bodies began to increase based on their emotions. Let's just say that. And the dark matter can then come into this realm through people. That's in fact what they discovered in 1950, that people can also produce dark matter by way of, it's very minute, it's very tiny, but it's measurable, it's quantifiable. In fact, they now know how much energy a person has to have before they go absolutely berserk. They also know how much uh, of that energy signature a person must have before an entity from that realm can possess them, which also allowed them to understand that not everybody can be possessed. Not everybody can be, but they're, 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 the person has to be prepared to be possessed. They have to be, in, in essence, they have to be a portal themselves to be possessed. Not everybody can be possessed. And so, not, not to get way off target, but this dark matter is everywhere. That is, that you know what, all these things, here's what, I mean, it really, it really gets to me, is that these scientists over the course of many years have quantified or they have calculated these things. They have extracted the truth, the facts, yet the Christians don't believe it. And these crooked people in certain places have already been harnessing this power for themselves and it's been effective every single step of the way. Yet the Christian community, for some reason, has a mental block on certain things of God as though they have all the time in the world. To, you, know, you know, I will say this, and then I'll get back to CERN, that if a person trusts their father, they don't need the father to explain everything. They just need, the fa they just need to know that the father said it. And they'll go do it. If, if you tell a child, go, you, know, you, you need to go rake the yard, a child's not going to sit there and say, well, what brings you to that conclusion? A child's not going to do that. You'll just go out there and rake the yard. Over time, you'll find out why, but you have already performed what the Father said. And But in the Christian community, we have to know why everything is before we do anything. In the scientific community, they see the facts. They know they don't understand it fully. And so they have experiments and they learn along the way. In fact, they're obedient to their own disciplines and we're not obedient to our own disciplines. So the problems about CERN, I know everybody's waiting on this. What could potentially happen from this? Well, they had another discovery that dark matter causes other pieces of dark matter that they have contained 
to, to react. In other words, if you have a container, say you had a, a, a teaspoon of dark matter, and, and let's just say you had it in Pennsylvania, and somebody else had that same uh, a teaspoon of dark matter in California, then as soon as the teaspoon of dark matter is exposed to the elements in Pennsylvania, it causes the dark matter in California to begin to activate. In other words, you lose containment in one place, containment in another place is going to be lost. It's going to be lost. So they're intimately tied together. Now we've covered the fact that people have the signatures of the energy of dark matter in them and matter. So they contain both matter and antimatter in a sense, the signature of energy. They're not put together. It's just that signature. And we draw upon those based upon our thoughts and what's in our minds and what's in our hearts, in a sense. With CERN, as they begin to collide these protons, dark matter is going to be produced in great numbers. I mean, in greater and greater numbers. Not only the matter, but the energy signature is going to also be released into this realm. You know what that's going to cause? It's going to cause the dark energy signature within people to begin to activate more and more. You see, it's going to become difficult for people to stay contained or controlled. In essence, they're going to become violent. They're going to become, they're going to have vivid dreams. The darkness within a person is absolutely going to begin to surface. And it's, this is not uh, theoretical. This is not uh, uh, some theory somebody thought of. This is absolutely 100% quantifiable, and it's happened before. It's going to happen in greater numbers this time. It's going to, it will take effect. That's also been weaponized. Nobody knows this, and I, I probably won't be in trouble for this, but they have a weapon concerning dark matter that they can put within a country or a specific place to cause chaos. It's a weapon. They've used it before. They can unleash this, and it can cause chaos anywhere they want chaos to be rampant. Also, there's something very important about that. There, I know this firsthand. There are often times you have to partake in the weapons development program, and you become a, a rat, so to speak, in a maze to see firsthand what the effects are going to be. I'll describe something. People can believe it or not, but sooner or later, they're going to experience it too. I am a Christian. I know that Jesus died on the cross for the remissions of sins, and now sits at the right hand of the Father, soon to be sent to us again. I rely on the blood of the Lamb. I am, you know, as a soldier, I count my Lord and Savior as my commander. And so I am used to taking orders and to operate life or death in those orders that he gave. That's the only thing that saved my life one day. I was thrust into a position where I had to absolutely 100% fight to keep my flesh under full subjection. I could not believe the intensity of what was happening. My thoughts were all over the place. It, it, it was almost like every evil thing that was in me came to the surface with a snap of a finger. Irritation, aggravation, anxiety, fear, uh, just anger, hatred all sorts of things in the snap of a finger. The only thing that kept me still, the challenge was to be still. The only thing that kept me still, I had to absolutely 100% focus on the Lord. I had to focus on Him. It's the only way to overcome that is to focus on Him and place the flesh under subjection. If a person's out there and they say, well, I have no power to control myself. Yes, you do. You don't want to control yourself. Believe me, that power is within you, is given through the Holy Spirit. I felt the power, the protective power, the blood of the Lamb and the Holy Spirit during that test. I was amazed. I didn't know this could be harnessed in that way. I did not know but it happened, and this was a weapon. This was a mild weapon. 
and you have to claim, people have to claim to the Word of God and His promises, most importantly, His instruction. You know, not one time when I was in that test, I didn't think about His promises. I thought about His love. That's what I thought about. And when I began to think about His love, something happened within me. Everything came under subjection as though it took no effect. That's what happened. They found the force that holds the dark energy or the dark matter away from this realm. They call it the wall. There's another name for that. A name of which that, that those particles they're going to find, they found part of it. They're going to find the other pieces that are in that wall. And when they find the other pieces to this wall, they will then be able to undo that wall. There's another name for that wall. The veil. Call it the veil. It holds back that round. They found out what's holding back the dark energy from, because it would be absolutely destructive if the two met. But they found out, now with this as a weapon, there is no counter weapon to this. China is building an LHC facility. They're building a particle accelerator. There are, to present day count, about uh, 14 particle accelerators in existence. 14, not just one. All the countries are vested in the CERN facility. Every single last country. In the United States, we have three facilities here. Three. I, I can't tell you where they are. One is, one, they began to build but they couldn't, but they went ahead and built it anyway. It's in one of the biggest states in the United States, and it's there and it's operational. It's also going to be powered up during this time. I'm saying this because when this thing does power up, the immediate effects are not what I'm worried about. That's not my concern. The psychological effects on people is going to become quite evident. And I know that people will come under some strange attacks, some strange occurrences and incidents. I know that the only way they can be protected from such things is their unqualified belief in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can't fake it. There is no substitute. People know if a person is real or not because they emit a different energy. That energy is that wall that the, this other realm cannot reach can't breach it, and they're, they're, it's absolutely going to take effect. The, the collider, it, it, think of a collider as a um, hundreds of nuclear explosions taking place within one second, and they're containing it. It goes beyond fusion. It's in a realm by itself when they collide protons. They are going to find these particles, and within months, they're going to put into motion what we talked about today, and people are going to feel these effects, and then this other realm is going to begin to spill over in multiple places everywhere. Violence will increase. The, the crucial side of this is that uh, with this show coming up, people are going to realize all too painfully uh, what we've talked about today, but they have to start now. They, they really have to, they can't make excuses for their flesh anymore. Well, take a looky right here. But take a look at this picture, guys. Isn't this interesting? All right, you got a guy saying we're happy at CERN, and he's got two signs around his neck. The first sign says Bond 1. And then the second sign you'll notice says Mandela. Now, if I understand correctly, this video was made before the Mandela effect shit was even discussed. If I understand correctly, I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me on it, but I believe that's the case. Now, you say, well, we got the Mandela part, but what's the Bond 1 part? Well, it just so happens that the first name of the first James Bond, or the, uh, excuse me, the last name of the first James Bond was Nelson. Okay, so the two signs together make Nelson Mandela. The first Bond's real name was Nelson. I can't remember if it was his first name or last name. I think it was his last name. But anyway, 
the two signs together make Nelson Mandela. So these son of a bitches at CERN knew exactly what the fuck they were doing in advance of when they done it. Isn't that a crock of shit? Now you say, well, Ron, it could be that maybe they're just, maybe the video came after all this Mandela effect shit and they're just making fun. Well, that still makes him an asshole. That still makes him an asshole. Okay, so either way, I fucking win. Either, either they knew in advance they were going to do this shit or they're making fun of this shit after the fact. You know, when, when we now know that families have been ripped apart, land masses have been changed, books, movies, uh, videotapes, uh, even the Bible has been changed. You know, and these motherfuckers are laughing about it. These motherfuckers are making jokes about it. These motherfuckers are happy about it. No. No, I'm sorry. At minimum, he's a fucking asshole. At minimum. All right. So this is a, this is this is a crock of shit. But I wanted to get this out. And and like I said, hat tip to uh, to the other old earthers out there. You know who you are. You know those of us that that know the Mandela effect isn't isn't us having a a, a brain aneurysm or some shit. You know, like some like some fool pointed out. Oh well, you know these those people that believe in Mandela effect, they're having a brain aneurysm or something. Uh, yeah, gee, thanks. Huh. Gee, thanks a lot. But no, no. Look at this picture, guys. I mean, this, this you want to prove. You know, somebody was saying just today, even somebody was saying, "I wish you got you had rock solid proof about this Mandela effect shit." Well, there you go. The guy's got bond one for the first sign, which is Nelson, and then he's got Mandela for the second sign. All right. These motherfuckers don't care. They don't give a shit. And and admittedly, some of the people that were in the video who were just young interns, they wouldn't fucking know what's going on any damn way. They're compartmentalized. But the, but this guy looks like he's got some age on him. He looks like he might have been working at CERN for a while. So he probably knows what the fuck's going on. He probably knows what's going on. And he doesn't care. They don't care. They're ripping apart the fabric of time and space and they don't fucking care. They think it's funny. They think it's funny. They made a joke, folks. They made a joke out of opening up the abyss. Okay? Even if you're a fucking atheist, I don't recommend opening up the abyss. All right? I just don't recommend that shit. At minimum it's bad mojo. Right? But um yeah, uh pretty fucking profound shit, wouldn't you think? I wanted to I wanted to get this out, man, because this is, you know, like I said, somebody just today was saying, "Boy, I wish we had some proof about this Mandela effect shit." Well, <laughs> well, here you go. Here's a guy with CERN working for CERN and he's got Nelson Mandela around his fucking neck. What more do you need? Now, like I said, as far as I know, the video that that has his picture in it came out um, before all this all this Mandela effect shit took off. If I understand correctly, I could be wrong on that, but I but I think it did. And if that's the case, then there's no doubt they knew what the fuck they were doing before they did it, which makes it even more sinister, which makes it even more vile, which makes it even more disgusting. But even if even if that's not the case. He's still making fun of a very serious topic, a, a topic that has destroyed people's families. A topic that has killed some people, brought some people back to life, and then killed them again, like like Muhammad Ali, killed him again, you know, for a third fucking time. He died in 2008, then he died in 2013. Now he's died again in 2016. Holy shit. How many times are they going to kill this motherfucker? You know. But I mean, You know, it's it's this kind of crap. It's this kind of crap. You know, and if this guy knew about that, if the people working at CERN knew what they were doing, knew that they would tear apart people's families, knew that they would kill people and raise people from the dead and then just to kill them again. If they knew that they were going to change the land masses of earth, if they knew that they were going to change books, movies, videos, TV shows, If they knew all that shit in advance and they did it anyway, what does that make them? What does that make them, folks? 
You know? I mean, think about that for a minute. If these motherfuckers knew in advance what they were doing and they did it anyway, that's that's unforgivable. I'm sorry, it's unforgivable. It's unforgivable. For many of us out there that are awakened to the truth, we know the reality of things, whether it be Bible verses that have uh, been changed or whether it's been... Uh, movie catchphrases that we all grew up on. These are things that have been ingrained into our culture here as uh, Americans and, and also worldwide. And, uh, you know, things from Star Wars or Forrest Gump, uh, the Berenstein Bears, um, just, just a plethora of different things out there that have been turned upside down. And it's not so much the issue of a movie or a song or a TV show, or a theme song, or a movie quote. That's not the issue. The issue is that we're not crazy. We're not crazy. We know what's going on. We know the truth. We know the truth of the Word of God. We know the truth when it comes to TV shows, movies, entertainment that we grew up on. Everybody knows that for Star Wars, it's Luke, I am your father, not no, I am your father. Uh, Forrest Gump everybody knows the reality that life is like a box of chocolates you never know what you're going to get right but yet the doggone devil wants you to believe that no you're crazy it's life was like a box of chocolates and you know what by the power of the Holy Spirit I feel I've been I've been afforded the opportunity to go ahead and, and expose the truth, the reality of things, uh, the way I see it, the devil, the enemy, CERN, the elite, the the Illuminati, the Luciferians, the Satanists, these folks that are out there, uh, you know, dabbling in witchcraft and whatever the hell else they're up to, in regards to this, this this great deception, I don't know what the hell they're up to, but I know this: the truth shall always be revealed. You can deceive. You could try to, you know, uh, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes. You could do try to do mass delusion to But you know what? The truth will always prevail. And today, I have a perfect example for you. So right now, I have listed up here. We have Forrest Gump. Everybody's seen this scene, and uh, this is actually filmed in one of my favorite places in America, which is uh, Savannah, Georgia. Beautiful place. So most everyone remembers this scene with Forrest Gump sitting on this bench talking about life is like a box of chocolates right mama always said life is like a box of chocolates well with the Mandela effect let's go ahead and play let's see what's going on here take a look hello my name's Forrest Forrest Gump You want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Life was like a box of chocolates. That is a doggone lie. That is an absolute doggone lie. Let's let's play that again. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So let's delve a little bit deeper in this. Let's look at the movie. Let's find out what did his mama actually say. What's the matter, Mom? I'm dying, Forrest. Come on in, sit down over here. Why are you dying, Mom? It's 
my time. It's just my time. Oh, now. Don't you be afraid, sweetheart. Death is just a part of life. Something we're all destined to do. I didn't know it, but I was destined to be your mama. I did the best I could. You did good, Mama. Well, I happen to believe you make your own destiny. You have to do the best with what God gave you. What's my destiny, Mom? You're gonna have to figure that out for yourself. Life is a box of chocolates, Forrest. You never know what you're gonna get. Mama always had a way of explaining things so I could understand them. I will miss you, Forrest. All right, so right there, the, the amazing scene right there with Sally Field and Tom Hanks. His mama says, life is a box of chocolates. Now, I'm, I'm going to try to contain myself because I'm so angry right now. I'm so frustrated. Um, this Mandela effect and the deception that's taking place and that there's many that think we're all crazy. They just straight think we're stone cold crazy and we're not crazy we know the truth and praise be to God I found I found some evidence I found some truth and I'll play that next I'll try to be quiet and let it play out uh, till the end and uh, well let's just go take a look and see so we can see the evidence that look his mom actually said life is right and now we're going to see the real true iconic scene this is behind the scene footage that I was able to find on the internet on YouTube. Actually, I, I didn't find it on YouTube. I believe I, I found this uh, off of like a Daily Motion or something like that, possibly. Um, but I will provide the link below and uh, let's roll it. Hey, dummy! Are you retarded or just playing stupid? Look, I'm for his camp. Forrest Gump starts as a boy and then he grows to a man who's someone who grew up in the deep south and he's limited in a way by having a very low IQ but he's a very decent man and that's what he is as a character. Would you like a chocolate? Oh, thank you. I found the book Forrest Gump in 1985 and I fell in love with it. I read the first line and the first line of the book is being an idiot ain't no box of chocolates. My mom always said that life is like a box of chocolates. Wait a minute. So, did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? You know, you know, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Because that's the scene right there, right here, that myself, along with millions of others, heard and remember. Right here. Let's play that again. We're going to play this a couple times. Let's do it. Life is like a box of chocolate. Said that life is like a box of chocolate. My mom always said that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. So right there, y'all. I'm done. It's just, it's, it's, it, it angers me. It's too much. Um, I got more videos planned. Please share the word. Share, share these videos. Uh, share these links make your own videos get the word out about the Mandela effect because it is real this is proof and evidence right here right now that something's going on millions upon millions of us remember seeing Forrest Gump and the iconic line life is like a box of chocolates but yet it's as though our reality got flipped upside down but you know praise be to God he allowed me to be able to find this evidence this proof and provide it to the world to see so please share this video make your own videos and let's get the word out about the truth behind the Mandela effect
The storms we chase are leading us And love is all we'll ever trust Yeah, no, I don't want to waste what's left And on and on we'll go Through the wastelands, through the highways Till my shadow turns to sun rays And on Folks. 